The text we're going to be engaging this morning was the first lesson read to us from Acts chapter 1, the first 11 verses. It's found in your service folder on page 3. If you'd like to follow along or if you want to look it up in your own Bible or on a Bible app on your phone, would you join me in word of prayer? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have to say, the last verse of that text, Acts chapter 1, verse 11, has always struck me as a little bit comical. Jesus just finished his earthly ministry. He's been here for three years ministering. He has died on the cross. He has defeated sin and death. He has risen from the dead. He has ascended into heaven right there in front of his disciples, and they're there to see it. There he goes, and he's just disappeared from their sight. Two angelic beings appear in their midst, appearing like mortal men. And they say to these disciples of Jesus, who are still looking because Jesus has just disappeared, and they say to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? They ask a question, but before giving the disciples a chance to answer that question, these angels go ahead and answer the question for them, as if what they say is reason enough not to be looking into the sky, and they say, This Jesus, who you've seen go into heaven, will come back in the same way you saw him go. Now, if I were one of those first disciples, I'd be saying, yeah, that's why we're standing here looking in the sky. We're expecting him to come back in the same way we saw him go. By the way, do you know when that's going to happen? Do they know when that's going to happen? These two angels? The disciples had the right intent, the right expectations, but they had the wrong timing. Right intent, right expectations, wrong timing. It's like me calling the insurance company and saying that I'm ready to put my daughter on our insurance plan because she's just gotten her permit. Good intentions, right expectations, wrong timing. They said she doesn't actually need to go on the plan until after she had gotten her license. It's like me, years ago, arriving at a friend's party that was supposed to be a birthday party, and when I pulled up, the birthday girl pulled up too. It was supposed to be a surprise party. <laughs> Guests are supposed to get there before the birthday person comes. Oops, messed that up. It, it's like it's like when we do things that we think are in the right time, but they're in the wrong time. So whether it's it's that or it's this birthday party or something else in your life. I had one more that I was going to think about myself, and I can't remember what it was. But maybe you've been through this too. Bad timing. You show up at a doctor's appointment early, comfortably early, you think. And then you're sitting there waiting, and they never call your name. So then you go up to the desk to check in, and you find out you're actually a whole day early. <laughs> never happened to you. You ever send a birthday card to somebody, and it's a, it's a numbered birthday card, like, happy ninth birthday. You find out later it was their tenth. Oops. If you ever make dinner for your friends, invite them over for a really fancy gourmet meal, only it's not actually ready until they were expecting to leave. Good intentions, right expectations, wrong time. This is what's going on with the disciples here. They're waiting for Jesus to return. Right expectations, good intentions, wrong time. But it's not for lack of asking. Because if you go back into verse 6, they say to Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, some think they're asking a political question. And if they ask that today, it could be a political question. If the question is, where are you citing Jesus, with the Palestinians or with the Israelis? Well, it could have been a political question in Jesus' day, too, if they were asking, so, who are you restoring the kingdom to? Is it to these, these Jews who shouted crucify and the Jewish leaders who put you on the cross? Or are you siding with the occupying Roman army, the ones that actually drove the nails that put you to death? But the disciples aren't asking either of those things when they ask this question. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? These are disciples who have been with Jesus for the last three years, and he began that ministry with them by teaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. 
For three years, he's been teaching them about the kingdom of God. It never has that been a political conversation. And, and every time in those three years, when somebody tried to bring their party, party politics into his teaching, Jesus always redirected them from the issues of this earth to the realities of the eternal kingdom of God. So whether it was them asking about taxes being paid to Caesar, or it was them trying to get him to comment on Pilate's slaughter of the Galileans on the day of Jewish sacrifice, Jesus always redirected them from the issues of this earth to the realities of the kingdom of God. And these disciples understand that by now. Because not only have they seen the realities of the kingdom of God taking place in the resurrection of Jesus, but for the last 40 days, we're told by Luke here in Acts chapter 1, if you go back to verse 3, he presented himself alive after his suffering with many groups and appeared to them for 40 days speaking about the kingdom of God. He's been teaching them exactly what the kingdom of God is and what this purpose is for restoring it to people. And so when they ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They have a good grasp of what he means. That from his parables, he said that those who killed the owner's son would have the kingdom taken away from them and given to others. They know that Jesus is going to be constituting a new Israel out of those who actually believe in him as the Son of God. They know that those who are the leaders of the current Israel are not a part of the Israel to come. They're not a part of God's kingdom anymore, and he's starting something new. They know all this taking place, and their question is, Lord, is it all happening now? Are you about to complete that work? Is it going to be done? They're asking Jesus, is it time? And Jesus responds to them saying, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. That's how the Lord answers them after verse 6. But Jesus had said to them right before he died, John chapter 15, it was the night before he died, so it's like 43 days before this. He had said to them, all that the Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. So if he's made known to them, all the Father has made known to him, and yet this is something that he cannot make known to them. Well, what is it that the Father has not made known to Jesus? 43 days before this, Jesus told them, all the Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. John 15, verse 15. Go back another few days to the beginning of that week, the week that Jesus was crucified. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Here in Acts chapter 1, they're on the Mount of Olives. They're near the village of Bethany somewhere. Jesus was right there with them about 40 days, 50 days before that too. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? There too, 50 days ago, they were at the same place on the same mountainside asking a similar question about timing. When will these things be? And what will be the signs of your coming and the close of the age? Now, they thought they were asking about one question. It's actually two different questions. And Jesus answers them in two parts. The first thing, when will these things be? Jesus had just, in Matthew 24, been talking about the destruction of the temple and how not one stone would be left standing upon another. And then they say, when will these things be? Well, that is going to take place in their generation, in their lifetime. But then they also ask about his coming the close of the age. Similar to what they ask about in this text, about when will the kingdom be restored to Israel. And there, Jesus gives them in Matthew chapter 24 a whole list of different signs and indicators of the coming of the close of the age. And he tells them which ones to trust and which ones not to trust. But among the pivotal ones that they're supposed to watch for is this. Matthew 24, verse 14. And this kingdom, of, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world. <coughs> as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. What's the key to watch for of whether the kingdom is going to be restored to Israel when the end of the age is going to come? This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the whole world, and then the end will come. Now, if they want to get more specific, okay, give us a day and an hour, Jesus. Well, verse 36 of the same chapter, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. They're asking a question about timing. 
Lord, at this time? Well, he's not able to answer that question about when everything will be complete and everything will be finished and the kingdom will be restored to Israel as God has constituted. He's not able to answer that question. The angels aren't able to answer that question because not even this time is the answer to that question. Even in his divinity, the Lord Jesus submits himself to the Heavenly Father and allows that to be one day and hour that the Father fixes by his own authority and will decide for himself. And so if they have the right expectations, these disciples, that one day Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to restore all this, and it's all going to be complete, and they're waiting for that to happen that day as they stand there looking up into the sky, they have the right expectations, but they have the wrong timing. And if these angels aren't able to tell them what time that is going to happen, then what time is it? Jesus had said, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. The gospel of this kingdom must be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. What time is it? It's the time for the proclamation of this through all nations. And so in our gospel lesson for today, from Luke chapter 24, Jesus tells them the same thing. You see it in verse 46. Jesus tells them from the scriptures that this must happen. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And he adds in verse 48 of our gospel lesson from Luke 24, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with that power from on high. What Jesus says to them here in Luke chapter 24 happens just before they walk up to near Bethany on the Mount of Olives. It says next, then he led them out as far as Bethany, and then he ascended to heaven. This happens just prior to Acts chapter 1 that we were reading. And in Acts chapter 1, that's how Jesus responds to them too. They said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus says, not for you to know the hour of the seasons that the Father set by his own authority, but verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, it, it's not time for them to know when Jesus is going to complete that restoration task of bringing his kingdom back to Israel. But it is time for that task to begin. And Jesus is going to begin it through them. First in Jerusalem until the gift of the Spirit comes, clothing them with power from on high, and then to the rest of the world. Then to the rest of the world. Now the disciples have a lot to learn about that task. They have a lot to learn about that task because up until now, the disciples are thinking about that new Israel. That new Israel that Jesus is going to restore the kingdom to is being, is being made up of people from the old Israel that their task is to carry that message to the Jews who would then believe in Jesus. And, and so they, they know that that's, that's our task now, is, is to carry this out. And so the next episode in Acts chapter 1, they begin to carry that task out. And the first thing they do is choose another apostle. Because the first Israel was constituted by 12 sons of Israel. Jesus, when he came to start his ministry, constituted that new Israel, chose 12 disciples, 12 apostles from the sons of Israel. But now with one of them, Judas, betraying Jesus and then committing suicide, they're down by one. There's only 11. And if Jesus started his ministry renewing the 12 tribes of Israel with 12 sons of Israel, then they need to choose another son of Israel to take that place. And so that's what happens next in Acts chapter 1. They choose another apostle. And they pray to the Lord later in the chapter, Lord, you who know the hearts of all, show us who it is that you've chosen to take part in this apostolic ministry. And yet they're still thinking that this ministry is simply to the members of old Israel. Bringing the good news to them that God's going to constitute this new Israel out of them. And yet Jesus has said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And it's not until that power has come upon them that they've been clothed with the Holy Spirit from on high that they begin to recognize the extent of this restoration work that God is doing. 
It's not until they see that same gift of the Spirit placed upon the Gentiles too. And it happens in Acts chapter 11, verse 17, when Peter describes what he saw at Cornelius' house, when he proclaimed the gospel to those Gentiles who feared the Lord, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. He said, if the Lord has given them the same gift that he gave to us, well, who was I to stand in God's way? And the other leaders of the early Christian church who are listening to them in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, glorified God and said, now we see that God has given even to the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. It's probably the Apostle Paul who put it the most clear in the book of Galatians. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, after all. And in Galatians chapter 3, he said, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And later in that chapter, chapter 3, down at verse 26, he says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, and therefore there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. Which is to say that the new Israel that Christ is constituting is not just made up of those in, in the first ethnic Israel who believe in Jesus and are now part of that kingdom of God being restored to them, but every person who believes in Jesus as the Messiah and the Savior, regardless of heritage or background or ethnicity or place in the world, can be brought in and made a part of this new Israel in Christ Jesus. People of every nation, every tribe, and every people, and you speak every language. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. That's what it's time for. Maybe you're thinking, in fact, if I were sitting in your seats today, I'd be thinking, Pastor, at this time, are you going to finish the sermon? Or is this going to go on until Jesus comes again? Which might happen. <laughs> but I don't want to wrap up until you get a good sense of what time it is. Because on God's watch, the time hasn't changed. It's been 2,000 years, but on God's watch, the time hasn't changed. The death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through which he defeated death, through which he, for he brings forgiveness, for the sins of the whole world and his resurrection and ascension into the, the right hand of the Father ushered us into the last time. And the disciples, the first disciples, were living in the beginning of that last time and we're still living in it today. And we don't know exactly when the end of that's going to be. Jesus said no one knows that except the Father. He's fixed that by his own authority. But we're still living in that time. Which is to say that the charge that Jesus gave to them is the same to us. The angels <laughs> prodded him because they were standing there looking at the sky. It's why he's standing there looking at the sky. This Jesus who you saw ascend into heaven will come back in the same way you saw him go. But you need the prodding because your job is to be witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And for us, Spokane, Washington and Idaho to the ends of the earth. Seems a little overwhelming. I think I'd rather just stand here and look at the sky. <laughs> you ever find a task is so big, so grand, that you don't know where to start? It's just too overwhelming. Our kids, when they were little, slept in one bedroom together. We had two girls, and so they had one bedroom. And we had another bedroom in the house that we turned into a toy room for them. So they wouldn't have to sleep in the room with their toys. That way they could actually sleep. The toys were down there. They slept up here. In that toy room, there was a place for everything. And they had it. They had Barbies, and they had pie pockets, and they had little pet shops, and they had crayons, and they had markers. They had everything. And there was a bin in a shelf for everything in their toy room so it would fit. I mean, name a girl toy. And I'm sure they had it or something like it. But when they would play and have their friends over to play, the first thing they did was take those bins off the shelf and dump them upside down. Put it all on the floor to decide what they were going to play with. And in short order, that room would be a disaster because everything in it was turned upside down. And when it was like that, it did not work for us 
to say to our kids, okay, go clean your toy room. And so when it was time to clean the toy room, if we said, go clean your toy room, they were overwhelmed. They didn't know what to do. The task was too big. And so either Jennifer or myself would have to go down there. We had a little picnic table in their toy room. We would sit on the picnic table, and we would tell them what to do one step at a time. Okay, now pick up the grounds. Pick up all the grounds. Yeah, that crayon too. Pick up all the grounds. And once they picked up all the grounds, okay, now we're going to pick up Barbie's Barbie clothes. Pick up all the Barbie clothes. Did you get all the Barbie clothes? Okay, now we're going to pick up all the pockets. Pick up all the pockets. We do all five pockets. And in that way, the room was restored. Now, I know you're not children. But as children of God, we look at this task of being witnesses to the whole earth, and it feels overwhelming. This is a world that's been turned upside down because of sin, and just devastated because of it. How can we be those who Jesus is using to restore the kingdom to his new Israel? And this is a task that's beyond us. Except that the Lord Jesus does just what he sent Jennifer and I to do as parents for our kids. He sent the power from on high, the Holy Spirit. We're going to celebrate that next week in our celebration of Pentecost. But the Spirit has now come. We have the Spirit, and this is the Spirit's job, to point us what to do, one task at a time. One task at a time. We see that play out in the book of Acts. That's what happens with the disciples. The next step is to choose another apostle to fill Judas' place. A little bit later in Acts, Philip, go to that Ethiopian eunuch who's in that chariot. Go tell them about me. Peter, go to Cornelius' house, Acts chapter 10, chapter 11, and, and tell him and his family about me. Paul, stop ministering in Asia. Cross the Aegean Sea. Go into Macedonia. There's a lady named Lydia, Philippi. I need you to meet. Remember her from our sermon last week? Every step of the way, the Spirit led them to what the next step was and made that mission something they could accomplish. The angels said to those disciples, why do you stand here looking in the sky? When we gather together here for worship on Sunday mornings, that's what we gather to do. To gaze upon the sky in the glory of our Lord, to worship Him, and I'm glad you're here. You're here because you have the right expectations. You have the right intentions. This Jesus who we see Him go to heaven is going to come back in the same way we saw Him go. One day, at the time the Father is fixed by his own authority. And it's good for us to gather together, reassure each other of that, and look forward to that day. But if we just stand here and wait for that day, we've got the wrong timing. Because now it's time to be his witnesses. And the Spirit is encouraging us to do that the same way he did for the first apostles. One relationship at a time. So who is it? that the Spirit is prompting you to go talk to this week in Jesus' name. Let's not just stand here looking into the sky. In Jesus' name.